Welcome back, my friends, to the Switch Pod, where IT leaders bring insights for other IT leaders and others that want to leaders. My name is Carlos Vargas, and I'm your host. And as every week, I am here with my two co-hosts, Paul Lewis and Howard Holton. Hey, guys. Hey, Carlos. One week, we'll have two separate people, and then all of a sudden, you won't be able to say that anymore. It'll be just two random guests. Yes. So, another week. How has it been this week for you guys? Well, it's been probably about this. <laughs> about this much. Yeah. It's actually kind of funny. I, I've had that come up several times, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was on a call on Monday, Tuesday, um, where... Uh, one of the guys says, hey, I think third party, you, you've met Howard before. And he goes, I don't know. You don't look familiar. And I went, when, when did we meet? And he goes, <laughs> kind of gives me the idea. And I went, I think that was more here. And he goes, oh, actually, yeah, that kind of. Nice. Oh, good times. Good times. So we get a lot of leaders listening to you guys inside our conversations, going through all the process of leading. But I think that a very interesting question is that from an IT standpoint, a lot of people look at the CIO as the top of the chain or the, the commander of the IT organization. And personally, I think that that's the same challenge that a lot of people have. We don't have a clear path on how someone gets there, how to become a CIO. I think that's a very interesting topic for today. Like that journey that people need to take to get there. What do you think about that, Paul or Howard? So, Howard, sir. yeah, so I, uh, Paul likes my rants, I think. I, I think maybe <laughs> a little too much, but, but, um, but I do kind of have a rant on this. Um, so the CIO is in fact the commander of technology at the company, right? in as much as the CEO is the commander in chief and the primary face of the company and the COO is responsible for how the company operates moving forward, right? The, the generally the primary business owner, um, the CIO is the primary technology owner. Uh, and, and I would say that there are three types of CIOs. Historically, there weren't historically the CIO generally came from finance and the goal of the CIO was very much cost reduction much more so, I would even say, than business enablement. And it kind of created this feeling in IT that we're slow to respond, we always say no, we do all these other things. Um, and I would say some of that is historically because um, it, it, its cost control was job number one. About 10 years ago, that, that flipped thoroughly. Um, and, and it kind of left us with three different types of CIOs. The first type is, in fact, that finance-based CIO, whose job has primarily been and continues to be cost reduction. There are plenty of companies where that is their main goal. Um, the second type is the transformational CIO. Right? This is a CIO that truly understands the value of technology, how to use digital transformation to get it, communicates from the board level all the way through the organization. Um, you know, this is your, the CIO of your top five tech companies. right? Um, there's, there's still tons of these CIOs, but I would say the chances that they made the transition from CFO, the CFO kind of um, vertical is slim. Uh, they'll report directly to the CEO um, and they have a lot of interaction with the board. They'll speak at shareholder meetings frequently. Um, the third is probably the most populated, the most common. And this is a CIO that more than likely has a background in cost, reduction cost prevention and has now had to transition into the transformational CIO. Mm -hmm. And it's very much like going from my primary language is English and um, in two weeks, sprechen Sie Deutsch. Right. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very alien kind of landscape. And so there's no clear path even for that, but I would say that's where most CIOs are. Um, today, if your goal is to become a CIO, you absolutely unequivocally must be the second type of CIO. Digital transformation must be in your blood. The use of data, analytics, right? Business as technology must be in your blood. You must be able to 
look at, a, at an organization, a situation, a workflow, and understand how can I make that digital in the right way? Right, so, so, and I would say that's kind of the big general kind of term. Now we can get into what's the daily life of a CIO look like, and maybe Paul's got some perspective on that. Well, I'll provide some commentary on what you just said, and I, and I agree entirely. In fact, um, especially if we get, you know, X tech, FinTech, Health Tech, X tech, uh, Reg Tech, right? It's all creating technology businesses from non business, technology businesses from just business services. It's interesting. In way back in my early, early career, like I'm talking like right out of school, first couple of years, I really wanted to be a CEO, a president. I wanted to be the top boss man. And I had conversations with executives all the time and I had a mentor. I said, what is it going to take for me to get there? What skill sets do I need to earn? CEO is what I want to do. And it was, it was hilarious the response I got time and time again. But the one person I respected most on, on the board of the company I happened to be on was this. Literally anyone can be a CEO. Quit now. Start up a company. You can be the president, the CEO, of whatever you want to be. It doesn't matter. Any random person can be a CEO. But there are very, very few people that can actually be a CIO. Actually be a CTO. Because that actually requires experience. Right? It requires uh, an, a, being a grizzled veteran in some ways. Right? It requires you in, to understand the domains of technology and the domains of the business and the domains of people and the domains of leadership and the domains of applications. It is a demands of finance, right? These are a complex series of things to which uh, actually requires a set of experience and, uh, and understanding that a you know, random CEO doesn't actually require to have. It was, it was awesome. So, so I share your perspective there. Um, and I think the trajectory from uh, practitioner, whether it's practitioner uh, administrator, practitioner programmer, practitioner business analyst, practitioner quality assurance analyst uh, to CIO is, is multidimensional and requires a pretty decent amount of time and, um, and gray hairs. And I think they're all valid, right? Um, I think that, that you can pick just about any starting path in IT and end up a quality CIO. Um, I don't think your starting path, and I don't think you, you need to ping pong from group to group to group. You need to understand what they do, how they operate, um, how they're best utilized, like how they work. Right? right. You don't need to actually have sat in all of the seats, but you, you do need to be a grizzled veteran. It's funny, every time you say grizzled veteran, I think, I think back to uh, to Star Wars, and initially they had two casts, and Nick Nolte was the the Harrison Ford, the Han Solo in the in the cast not actually used. Right. And uh, and there's a comedian that does a great bit on it. That it's all I can think of. It's the most frustrated thing in the world. It's oh Chewbacca, oh Christ, oh geez. Like I could see an entire movie of that, but that is kind of how I always feel as a CIO. <laughs> right. right. You're on a call and all that's going through my head is, oh, for Pete's sake, do we really? You know? It's now, being able to reconcile that emotion into positive action, I think, that makes a good CIO. Now, role of CIO. Now, we, um, I think we talked about this last time, the difference between pain points and non-pain points. But I think it's fair to say true of CIO, true of CTO, true of IT leadership, they spend far more time on joy than they do on pain. Right? They do far more time on celebrating success, or at least articulating success, celebrating leadership, uh, celebrating the green projects that have delivered on business value, celebrating uptime, celebrating um, um, you know, application delivery. These are things they spend time on, especially if they've moved the needle on something. They, they, just, spent, they just saved a million dollars over the capital expense they did last year, and they get to use that money for new things. Like they, quality time goes into proving that they're successful by either doing the cost containment or creating some level of innovation versus pain points where uh, they're worried all the time. They're losing sleep at night. What keeps you up at night? Very few things keep up a CIO at night at work, right? It might be other obligations in their life, but it's rarely at work is keeping them up, right? It's still in many ways a job and a career and interesting success, but you know, you're not necessarily losing sleep over it. I would say one of the key differences between the CIO level and any anything else within IT is um, in any other position, you spend some percentage of your time communicating 
to your peers, and if you're in leadership, I would say that's your team, um, you spend some percentage of your time communicating up and you spend some percentage of your time communicating out, mm -hmm. right? To, to things outside of IT. Um, I would say a CIO spends almost no time communicating down, almost all their time communicating out, mm -hmm. right? By which I mean, this is the strategy that is communicated down and is clear, right? This is a change to the strategy it is communicated down in a clear way, right? There's no right. lack of communication there. It's not a black box. But most of the time isn't spent wondering what are the people under me doing, rather reporting on the things or celebrating the things that we are doing and communicating what we need to do them better or do them more. Right. Right. Versus most positions, I don't think that's true. Right. And I, and, and I found that to be an absolute flip moving through kind of the hierarchy to getting to that position. Yeah, because you're responsible for different things. While it's true that you are responsible for technology success, you are now additionally responsible for business success, especially as DX equal IT, right? So every digital transformation project is in fact an IT project. And therefore, everything you do, the outcome of those things uh, becomes a material impact to the business, not just a side effect, right? Not just making it incrementally better. It might actually be attracting a client segment you currently don't attract now, right? It might be top line money versus bottom line money because top line is what, what creates growth in an organization, right? Bottom line is just freeing up money to do other things, right? Uh, so that the, once, you, once you're a CIO and reporting to the CEO and potentially have board responsibilities where you have to present to the board on a quarterly basis and say, this is how I'm spending money, especially cybersecurity money, right? Uh, you've, you've now have a different mindset. You are now part, you are a peer to the COO, peer to the uh, sort of operational units that are contributing money to the business. And you, you have different legal responsibilities, right? right? If you are a true chief, um, then you may, have, you may have not only fiduciary duties, but you may have liability issues that you need to be aware of. And, and risk, like reputational risk. In fact, I, I had a CEO that I worked for, worked for for years who uh, constantly, time and time again, said, my job exists to ensure that you don't go to jail right? That our names don't get in the newspaper, that we are not one of the problems to which is creating, you know, growth opportunity or opportunity loss within the business. That's what I want to ensure that I want to be. And this person actually came from the finance world. They were, you know, coming from the perspective of how do I uh, grow in an investment scenario? And I'm going to use that, that, that process, the philosophy and apply that to IT. So you mentioned a lot of different areas and I took a couple of notes in here and you mentioned that you may be not managing directly but under you you may have different tiers you may have managers you may have directors VP probably EVPs and then get there share a little bit about the differences probably from a leadership standpoint and probably from a responsibility that probably somebody that is at a lower level that may want to become a CIO may think, well, if I am in this role, but I want that one, what, what is the, the difference? A manager versus a CIO or a director, what is the difference that like users saying are communicating in a different way? What are some of those differences? Let me walk through sort of my career progression as an example. It, it won't be every example. In fact, Howard will tell his story. It'll be a different example, but let me walk through it. So, so I start my IT career with IT specifically uh, CIS programming um, education, right? So I have a degree in computer information systems and programming. I go straight into the uh, mainframe slash AS400 programming world. And I'm just, I'm just a doobie, right? I'm just a guy who's, who's getting assigned a project and typing it out and sending it off for QA. Uh, from that, I move to different technology sets. So now it's mainframe, it's AS400, it's client server. I, I see a different kind of world with a different kind of programming. And you start to build success as somebody who's delivering on time and on budget with quality. And for the most part, has ideas outside of the project being delivered on. From that, I start to lead teams of programmers. From leading teams of programmers, I moved into sort of a product management setting to say, now that I fully understand and appreciate 
one or two applications, I can actually move into the mode where I understand how the businesses are using these applications and I can deal with the features and functions. I can add to that application. I can be part of that process. Then I moved up the chain of product management, became the director and vice president of product management on a series of products that became commercial products. And even to this day are used out by you know, a variety of places in Canada. From the vice president of uh, product management, then I start to see a much broader understanding of the portfolio and a much broader understanding of the technology. And I shift into the product management and architecture side. So now I have the technology architecture and the product management and growing my understanding of the platforms itself and the underlying security and the underlying code uh, then became uh, CTO of organizations. And then CTO of organizations, I start to see you know, a broad mix of what the impact of the business is to this technology and how, how I apply business change and long-term thinking to the platform and technologies required to do this. And then once you are at executive leadership, then you shift from other parts. You, uh, at some points, I was the VP of applications. At some point, I was a VP of IT infrastructure. At some points, I was the CISO, right? So you sort of see a broad appreciation for technology before you, before you sort of run into the, you run the whole shop, before you sort of see the world as, as, as a complete entity and able to contribute to the business. Howard, what, what was your, what was your storyline? So mine was much more a zigzag shotgun, mm. right? Um, I started very young. Uh, my dad was a um, law school professor and owned the only law office in town. So I thought I was going to be an attorney. Um, Word Perfect 5.1 came about. Um, I had developed a little piece of, I was a nerdy kid. I developed a little piece of software to keep track of my baseball card collection, football card collection, basketball card collection, and the value thereof, and then tracked the trend over time. Hmm. It was a really simple thing. I did it on my, you know, the PC my parents owned. Um, Word Perfect 5.1 came out. My dad was messing around with trying to get something to work. And he said, hey, how did you get that other thing to work? And we started collaborating on a piece of software and released that piece of software when I was 11. Nice. So I had my first published piece of software when I was 11. Right. Um, so millionaire at 12, billionaire at 15? Is that the... No, 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 no. My, <laughs> my dad was a failed hippie, failed businessman. Um, we were not, we were not, we were successful for the time and place, um, but not, not wildly successful. Um, we relatively rapidly transitioned from the software to infrastructure, right? To setting up networks, configuring all that happy nonsense. Um, and when I, before I graduated high school, uh, I presented to my board and I had 20 employees working directly for me. Nice. Um, there's good and bad in that in a huge way. Um, when you are effectively running a company as a teenager, uh, it becomes really complicated to become someone's employee thereafter. <laughs> right. Cause it's like, nah, I've sat in the seat before. I know what, I know how complicated this is. It's like owning a restaurant, which I also did for a brief period of time. It makes it really hard to go to a restaurant and accept crap. Right. It's like, I know how hard this is to do. I've put this same product out. Like I understand all the steps involved here. Um, but it was a small company, right? So, so I would say that's, that's manager, maybe director level kind of thought process, right? So my focus was on the people on my team and managing their day-to-day -day activities, like scheduling their activities, ensuring that I had the right number of people and the right people on a particular project, right? A lot of project management at that, at that kind of level, um, but mostly logistical project management, mm -hmm. right? Um, I never stopped being technical. That's, that's one thing that I would say is, is not, it's not uncommon, but it's also not common, right? There is no requirement to be a, that to be a CIO, you must be even the top three, top five, top 10 most technical person, persons in the room. Sure. Um, but I tend to be a very technical person. Uh, that's just something I enjoy doing. So it's something I continue to do. Uh, the advantage as a CIO is it doesn't have to be as practical, hmm. right? I now spend a lot of time looking at what is five years away and is it in fact better? And I have to say that the strategic value of technology as a, um, an area of study is something that doesn't get studied very often, right? It's like the conversation, Paul, you and I had on, the, on, on a customer call uh, earlier was uh, customers asking for a specific requirement 
And the kind of answer on the call is no. Right? As in, we don't do that. Right. Black there and white, no binary. At, right, right. But there was no look at why would I want to use that technology? Mm -hmm. What problem does that technology, was that technology specifically designed to address? And then do we address it? And how do we address it even if it's a different way? Right. Because as a customer, I don't care. Right. And that's kind of the level of technical that I really, really thoroughly enjoy. I don't really enjoy the, the um, you know, keyboard commander anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I really enjoy kind of comparing uh, different technological solutions to the same to a similar problem and seeing kind of which one's better. Why do you do it that way? Why might you look at it this way? I find that to be interesting. And my background is really thoroughly infrastructure. Like I did some development and I've run development teams um, far more in analytics than in tr true software. Um, but I'm a hardcore like infrastructure guy. I, I still would have no problem showing up to a data center, racking and stacking and building, designing the whole data center. Um, I came up through the enterprise architecture path and my enterprise architecture path was still um, kind of an infrastructure path, right? Uh, you know, hardware, software, uh, bits and bytes to keep the things moving rather than a software design path. Right. So if, if you were to list skill sets of a CIO, what would be top three for you? Oh, skill sets of a CIO. Number one is the ability to present. Mm. Number two is the ability to communicate. And number three is the ability to empathize. <laughs> yeah, right. I absolutely believe present. Um, I absolutely believe communicate in a variety of forms, whether that be in person or in written form or in video or in an ability to build a uh, influential, in, influential PowerPoint presentation, an influential visual. Those are all sort of means of communication. Uh, and yeah, I, I would wrap it up more in, in leadership, right? You have, to, you have to spend more time with individuals, especially individuals to which you think will take your place eventually or at least will be a, uh, you know, one of the top 10, 20, 50 people in your organization to be successful. Like personally take the time to grow those particular leaders to be the leaders you know that they can be, right? Especially if there's a skill set gap. It, it, when, you were, when you were operating IT, um, what were the skills you had to learn in order to get to that last step? So just before taking the helm, what, what what were the skills you didn't have that you had to obtain? Um, to be honest, it was the, 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 the one that was probably the most difficult was the language of the boardroom. Mm. Like the language of the boardroom, I find to be a lexicon that is somewhat unique. Um, almost everyone else has, has more patience than a boardroom, right? Almost everyone else has a different focus than the boardroom. Um, I found that one to be an interesting kind of, you know, topic of conversation. Um, and then uh, how little magic there actually was. You know what I mean? Like, like there's this expectation that you're going to walk into something that's defined. Um, everyone kind of knows their place and you're a piece, you're a chess piece on a chessboard. And what you find out is, in fact, you're a player of the game. There are no more pieces. Like you are no longer a piece. And so you have to define what your strategy is and what your game is. Um, all the way up through EVP, there are training wheels in place. At right. CIO, training wheels go away. That's right. There's a different expectation for that person. And I would agree with you on the board communication because you have a you know twelve minute slot and you've got to communicate and evangelize and get an agreement and walk away in that twelve minutes. There's no other minutes. You know, you don't get any other time. This is this is the time. You better be very concise and ask the very specific question that you want to yes or no on. And it and it's up in the air. You have no idea whether it be yes or no, no matter how convincing you are. And then deal with the consequences. Accept well, it, move on, implement. And and I'm not a um I'm not a definitive guy. Yeah. Right. If you ask me something, I'm an I, I live and breathe nuance. Ninety nine percent of the time, that's an amazing skill as the CIO. Right. Twelve minutes in front of the board, it yeah. is not. That's <laughs> correct. Have, there's no it's 12 minutes. So they're going to ask you a question and you have to be able to say yes or no. Right. Not, well, <laughs> in reality, it depends. Like I'm a renter, right? So everything I say is in reality, like here's all the nuance of that situation. They want to right. know, 
do I vote yes or do I vote no? Well, <laughs> I, I would so say the one way. thing I had to overcome skill set wise was uh, comfort and ignorance. Uh, I really had to get over, I had to overcome the need to know everything, the need to know what my team did, uh, to need to appreciate in detail the code or the infrastructure or the process or the client uh, consideration or the product roadmap uh, because you don't have that time, luxury or energy when you're at the head of the, head of the shop, right? You have to be comfortable that you have a set of leaders that uh, can deliver on their own value, that they can uh, achieve their own KPIs, that they're professional and as grizzled as you are, um, and you have to think uh, not about today, you have to think about a month from now, a year from now, five years from now, and don't worry about what happens today. That, that was the big sort of overcoming in terms of that leadership change for me. I would say you should have that at, e at EVP, if not earlier. Yeah. Like, like the point that you're dealing with other VPs, yeah. I feel that that's kind of needed. Um, so I, so I may, you know, I may have been in a different situation or whatever, but that's, that's kind of how I felt about that. It's true. Uh, but I find once you get to the top, um, there's more things you don't know than you do know, right? Even up to the point where you're leading application development or IT infrastructure or architecture, you're still intimately familiar generally in that domain. But once you get to that next level, there are far more things you don't know and you have to be comfortable with not knowing that. I would say... Um, you also don't have the opportunity to mentor to get that. Right. I think that's probably the biggest change. Like at the EVP level, you absolutely have the ability to mentor still VPs and go, I, I don't actually need to know all this. I, I need you to deliver the information in the following way. When you right. get to the CIO seat, you, you no longer have the ability to mentor to get the result. You have to kind of expect that that's going to be the result, mm -hmm. right? That you're not going to be bombarded with the minutia, but rather... You know, you can turn to your people and say, I, I need you to give me the high level pieces that I must know to move forward um, and that they will deliver on that without having to constantly go back and forth. And go, no, it's too detailed. I, I, you know, for the future, I don't need all this other stuff. <laughs> will there right. be a difference between an enterprise or a big enterprise and a small enterprise CIO? Yeah, yeah. There's far fewer steps. Yeah. I mean, there's there's far less stuff, but but it, it, it actually means the job of CIO... Is different, but I would say it's harder because you are doing a lot more internal um, and, and everything kind of gets pushed your way rather than um, like there may not be a CTO, there may not be a CISO, there may not be, you know, a CDO. You may be stuck doing all of those things. You may have far more hats um, and trying to still digitally transform, still build the data practice, still do all those things mm -hmm. while being even more cost sensitive. Right? You, you simply don't have the capital to, to push and you probably don't have the people and resources to push. Yeah, and there's a big difference of scale. You're a bank and you have a $4 billion IT budget. That's a pretty big impact to the bottom line of that business. Uh, but you have more opportunity, right? So when you're spending that kind of money, uh, you have much more influence to your providers, right? You can say, listen, I'm not spending the money. Here's the dollar figure to which I'm going to give you and you're going to service me in this way. Right? You have much more influence and power. Um, however, uh, there's an expectation that um, you have to give up that when you need to give it up. Like there's no, there's no debate at that point. Like if they need 500 million, you're going to give them 500 million and you're going to find a way to do that. Yeah. So yeah. it looks like you have far less negotiating power in the mid, the, the, the mid tier, right? Um, right. But, but it also means you, have a, you also tend to have a lot more freedom. Mm. Um, I would say there are a lot less ch kind of checks and balances, right? You get second guessed a lot less in a, in a midsize. Um, they, yeah. they, they do place a lot more trust in you. Um, and other than being financially bound, I, I think it's a great spot to be. Um, and, you know, uh, it kind of, like at that tier, it's kind of what you make it. I think that's great to go because then we have people listening to us that, as we mentioned, may want to get there. So that journey, let's say that we start with a manager or well, a little contributor, to get to that level, to a CIO, what does that look like? Where do we start thinking? Is there a difference in the way that you think or what you do? Guide us through that process. 
So I would say the very, very, very first most important thing is you have to wrap your head around, around the fact that there really aren't people. There's teams, mm. right? Um, you kind of have to stop looking at what's best for all of the individuals and rather look at what's best for the team, what's best for the teams, plural, and what's best for the organization. And I would say as you progress, it, it, it very much goes kind of in that order, right? As a manager, I'm, I can focus on the individuals, right? I have a team, but I need to take the time to make sure that each of those individuals not only fits the team, but kind of gets what they need from the team, that know their place in the team, that understand the value of the team, blah, 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 right? At the director level, I'm probably not seeing but one in five individuals. Right. My focus is much more on is the team cohesive? Yes or no. Right. Is the team growing in the right way? Yes or no. Is the team overall healthy? Yes or no. Right. Whereas as a manager, I might look at those same questions, but I, I would have a very different answer. Is the team healthy? Yes or no. No, because I have this person and this person that aren't getting along. And I would take direct, act, direct action. Right. By the time I get to the VP level, I probably don't have time for that anymore. And it's much more along the lines of a clock has now started to fix it and fixing it very well may be letting whoever is determined to be less valuable on the team let go. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you kind of have to put the team first, then the organization, then the business, right? And you really kind of have to keep that as your primary focus. Oftentimes, you're forced to make a decision that is bad for people. Right? It just doesn't seem good on paper that, that ultimately you have to go, well, given all of the variables I have, all of the dials I can turn in whatever ways I can turn them, right? my sphere of influence, I've done the best to make it the best I can for my people, but ultimately you know, this team is going to be damaged by this decision, but it's still the best decision for the organization. Um, I would say anytime you make a decision that you don't keep the people in mind, you're making the wrong decision you're doing it wrong. You're being a bad leader, right? Because it really is about delivering on people, but doing that in a way that, that benefits the, the company in the best way possible. And sometimes that's a layoff. I've always described it as um, where you're looking, right? So as an individual contributor, where you're looking is in the mirror, right? What do I have to do for myself in order to grow um, as an individual technologist, as an individual person, um, as an individual business leader, what do I need to do to add skill sets? As a manager, you're looking down, right? You're not looking in the mirror, you're looking down to say, how can I make this team successful, whether it's two people or 30 people, right? Depends on how size the team. How can I make this team successful? Well, how can I empower them? How could I find new skill sets for them? How could I determine that, that they require new tools? How do I justify another person? That kind of work. The higher you go up, maybe the director VP level, you start to not look down, but you tend to look sideways. Let me look at my peers in this organization. How can we work together to solve a much bigger, more complex problem, right? It, it's not just me as a VP of application. It's me, a VP of application, the VP of IT infrastructure to deliver on a project holistically. Now we need to work together. Now we're peers. Now I need to go to the VP of ITSM because they're worried about the production environment, right? What happens in the service desk and the configuration management and the, the CMDB, all those things, right? So I start to look together. And then I go a little bit higher and now I have to look uh, sometimes upwards, right? And now I have to uh, deal with the business. I have to deal with um, the line of business, the CFO, the CEO. I've got to look upwards and say, Here's not only my successes, but to take the direction of the company and bring it down. And then once you get to the top, as, as Howard started out to begin with, um, I have to look out, right? It's not just up, but it's not just down and sideways, but it's out to say, what else is happening out in the real world in my peers and other CIOs in the same or different industries? And how can I apply that interesting change into my business to make it better, right? So in many ways, it's where I'm looking through, the, through that change. Yeah, it very much is. I, I like the, um, the analogy of ships, mm. right? Where uh, as an individual contributor, you're responsible for that rope. You're responsible for that broom. You're responsible for that individual thing, right? As a manager, you're responsible for that sale or those sales. 
currently. Mm -hmm. As the VP, you're responsible for that ship. As the EVP, you're responsible for whatever those ships, plural, are doing. That mission, right? That fleet. As the CIO, you're responsible for the Navy. Mm. Right? So I, I, I'm a big fan of, of kind of um, US history. I'm obviously, I'm an American, right? So I spent a lot of time studying how we got formed, how we got created, and why. And I used the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria as kind of the example, right? The admiral of that fleet, small as it is, was the VP. The CIO never left Spain. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and that's kind of, I hate to say it, but that's kind of the view you have to take. I have planned this thing with the best information. I hand it to the Admiral and I say, now figure out what your schedule is going to look like. Tell me what you're going to need to make it happen. This is the budget. Like I have allocated you the funds. Go with God. I have 16 other missions that are going to be done at the same time with other admirals. Right. Um, and that's kind of like the trend. I would say the transition between EVP and CIO or VP and CIO, depending on how your company is tiered, is by far the biggest of all of those transitions. It's the mm -hmm. largest gap to jump. And you really have to change the way you think to, to see a much broader view and, and simply expect that the tactical view vanishes completely. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I, not only do I, do, do I not care what's happening on a minute by minute basis on a, on even a day by day basis, but I may have zero visibility to it regardless, even if I do care. And so you kind of like, it's just really interesting to, to move up. You have to give up so much control. Mm -hmm. And I would say that if you, if you find yourself in a position where even as a director, you feel like you need to micromanage, like you feel like you need to know absolutely everything that everyone is doing, you need to fix it. Then don't wait till you're a VP. Don't wait till you're an EVP. And that is very, very interesting that you mentioned that because then from all this conversation, there's different scopes and different ways of skills, but there's a skill that for me keep coming up that is leading, that is leadership. Can you talk a little bit about of that different transition from, let's say we have someone that may be at a starting point, like Paul mentioned, he started coding but he had his sight, he was looking at going higher. It may be different the way that an individual contributor lead themselves versus a manager, a director, a uh, VP or an EVP to be able to get there. Can you share a little bit about that? Be introspective. Like, like seriously, if, if you want to succeed in this career, you must be a leader, not a boss. Simon Sinek, I, I, I quote this all the time. I kind of feel like a broken record, so I apologize. But Simon Sinek said, a boss has the title, a leader has the people. Right? And so if you really want to do this and you want to do it and you want to accelerate it, right? You want to do it at the, at the fastest pace you can do it while still being really good at the job. Start by being a little introspective. Start by looking at yourself and discarding your ego. Stop telling yourself, I'm, I'm awesome at this. I'm great at this. I'm an amazing. I'm amazing at this. I'm the best that anybody's ever seen. Because it's first off, it's probably not true. It's extremely unlikely. And second, it, that, that kind of attitude doesn't really help you. So be introspective and say, what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? And really importantly, where I am today, who are the leaders? Not who has the title, but who are the leaders? Because those are the people that you can then start looking to and saying, how do I look at what they do and learn how and why they do it? Not to emulate it, right? But to kind of dissect it and take the good and the bad and look at them both kind of equally. And I hate to say it, but we learn infinitely faster from bad than we do from good. It's far easier to see, I don't want to be this kind of leader. I don't want to be this kind of, of executive. It's much harder to go, I, I want to be this kind, because you, you still have to break it apart into its small pieces and go, why did this person act this way? How would I have acted differently? What would the result have been had the interaction been different? What would the result have been had the interaction been similar? Pick mentors today. I would say, uh, and I use this phrase a lot, I, everybody retires, so you might as well retire happy, right? 
and the and the definition of retirement or the definition of you know dying isn't um, everybody becomes the prime the prime minister of Canada or the president of the United States. Not everybody gets to the same level, the same role, the same anything. In fact, once you're sort of running the ship, right? Once you're in senior executive in IT, you have to appreciate that a good portion of the people in your team will not become CIO, nor do they have the desire to be CIO. There are many, many people on my team that has spent you know, 30, 40 years as an individual contributor, an individual programmer, business analyst, QA person, and that's what made them happy. Right? There was no requirement or, or need to go up through the hierarchy, and that's okay. And it's okay to go halfway and be satisfied with your job at halfway and retire halfway. That's fine. It's not a journey for everyone, both in desire or capability or experience. Uh, and that's okay. There are lots of different ways to be happy and retire. I would also say if you're going to pick leadership, especially in IT, very immediately, the moment you make the decision, you have to turn off the desire that you will be the highest paid person in the organization or the highest paid person at your level right. or that you'll be higher paid than the people that work for you. Right. Right. Um, I was kind of shocked when I started a position, they gave me a team and they said, you may have people that are, that are paid more than you. And I said, okay. And they went, is that going to be a problem? And I went, I, I don't know why. Like, you probably I, deserve it. More than a week. Like, <laughs> fine. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm not worried about, about comparing myself to other people. I'm just worried about comparing myself to myself. Right. right? Am I getting, is, does my remuneration, right, my total package, equal or exceed my value? If the answer is yes, great, right? And so then I can, then I can also look at everyone else the same way. Um, the, more of, the more of your ego you put into that, the more of a boss and the less of a leader you become. Before we finish up, I want to ask you know, one other question because I, I have an answer for it. Um, what was the... When you became, when you, when you grabbed the helm, when you became the leader, um, what, what did you do poorly? Like, what was the one thing you did wrong? What was the, what was the mistake you made when you first started out? <sighs> um, I, I don't know that there was just one. Um, <laughs> okay, name one mistake. <laughs> yeah, so, so I would say. Um, Failing to pay as much attention to being a mentor as you did before is a huge mistake and one I do not intend to repeat. Um, really understanding um, the potential of those that will follow you um, and ensuring that, that they still receive the same attention that, that, is, that they deserve. For me, it was failing to celebrate the success of my predecessors. But it's very easy to go into a job, especially when you're, when you're, when you become the captain, to say every everything that's happened in the past was bad. I know what's good, and these are the changes we're going to implement. When in fact, all the decisions that were made in the past were appropriate, were correct for the information and time and resources that they had. Right? Celebrate that you were successful because of all of those past decisions. We might make different decisions now. That's only because we have different budget and different people and different information and a di if different time and likely a different mandate. Like it, past isn't bad. Past is past. That is very, very insightful. Uh, understanding that to be the leader, you need to start leading yourself. Stop thinking about yourself, but how you can then lead the team. And then looking at the different progressions. So from becoming a CIO, you're, you're the leader or the captain, as you mentioned. I love the analogy, Howard, about the Nina Pinta Santa Maria, uh, Christopher Columbus. I'm like, you know, I have never thought about it, but now that you explain it that way, I'm like, hey, that's a very good one. Uh, you probably have to digitalize or something. Um, but so when someone wants to become a CIO, you guys share, stop thinking about your ego. It's not all about you. Take the time to look for mentors. Take the time to then look at leading or learning to lead 
across, not only up. I think that uh, Paul mentioned about that. Will there be anything else that someone that may want to or is already in that journey should look so they will be positioned correctly and remove or correct anything that they may be doing wrong? So, so I have two pieces of advice and then I'll, I'll be quiet, maybe. Um, the first piece of advice is as a leader, it is always your fault, always your fault. Like we like to talk about the buck stops here, but the fact of the matter is if someone on your team failed to do something, you are responsible because you're the leader, which means you put the wrong person in a position to make that mistake. Right. It doesn't mean that you don't do anything to correct it, but it means you accept responsibility for that failure. However, the opposite is not true. All of the success belongs to your team, mm -hmm. right? Your job is to enable them to be the best they can be. So when they're successful, you did your job, it's their success. When you failed, you didn't do your job, therefore it's your failure. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds like it would be career limiting, but I have to say it's career accelerating probably more than nearly anything other than communication skills. And then the second is you do not own your employees. You rent 40 hours a week of their time or less. Mm -hmm. And it's a consistent 40 hours, not a whenever you feel like it 40 hours, right? And the goal is to get a work product, not a number of hours. If you have people today that are working more than 45 hours a week and they're paid for 40, figure out why, because you're hurting yourself and you're hurting them. Mm -hmm. I Those agree with both of Howard's perspectives. I would add one more. Uh, and that one more is IT fails. Software has bugs in it. Infrastructure will, will fail on you and you have to replace it. Be comfortable that that stuff fails. You can't prepare for every eventuality. Things are going to happen and you just have to have the process and people and attitude to deal with it, right? Nothing's perfect. Don't assume it'll be perfect. Mitigate risk and reduce liability. You can never fully eliminate it. That was fun. That was a very good episode. And as always, my friends, make sure that you subscribe and you share this, not only with your team, but with everyone that you know, because the whole idea is that you can grow as a leader and that other people can also grow as a leader. So my friends, we'll see you in our next episode.